thank you again for joining us uh, with our podcast series. Uh, inshallah, we will yet again share with uh, you the reflections for self-development and as we go along with our conversation, we'll discover some of the beauties of uh, spiritual uh, reflections. Uh, so Mufti, uh, I think you mentioned in episode zero uh, regarding uh, drinking tea. You love drinking tea. Uh, I'd like to ask an, a personal question. Um, what kind of tea do you like to drink? Um, that's that's an interesting question. I I drink a range of teas. Um, there are there are specific types for specific times of the day, uh, even the weather, uh, and even what I uh, watch or hear. As I give an example, you know, um, sometimes when I uh, watch a, an advertisement um, or a, or a, you know come across. Uh, Hindi movie or Hindi oh, song. Okay. Uh, what immediately comes to mind is masala tea. Wow. Those are the spices, right? Uh, and it just just uh, triggers me to to either buy one or make one, and I enjoy that masala tea at that point. Uh, usually, it's in the uh, afternoon. Mm. Um, otherwise, I drink different types. Uh, in the evenings, for example, I prefer to drink uh, either green tea or black tea. Just just black tea with no sugar, no milk. Uh, if I do drink uh, black tea with milk and sugar or a bit of sugar and so on, uh, usually in the morning, uh, mm. early in the day, um, because there's the rest of the day to burn, you know, all the calories of the sugar and, and milk. So different types of tea, and I like to try uh, different ranges, uh, and I learn from those sort of trials which ones work for me, which ones don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on the uh, timing of the day and probably uh, depends on the mood. And, exactly. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, weather as well. Uh, you mentioned about drinking masala tea as if it's, um, it's uh, just available near your uh, kitchen. Do you make your own uh, masala tea? I do, yes, I do actually. Uh, it's quite difficult to find uh, a masala tea that I really like. Um, so... Usually, I uh, try to make my own because I feel happy making it. And I try my best to make it for somebody else too. Mm, okay. So at home, I'm very uh, lucky that my wife likes uh, my masala tea. <laughs> so at least you can make for the both of us. Yeah. Uh, it's not too difficult. I mean, you just put some spices like uh, usually cardamom. Mm. You won't go wrong with cardamom. Um, and if you have saffron with you, Mm. Actually, I made one for you as well. You oh, can try wow. later. Yeah, we'll so, look forward for that. Yeah, cardamom and saffron. Um, you see, the difference making tea at home is you can spend a bit more time making it. Uh, uh, when you go elsewhere and buy it, usually people have to rush to make because, you know, they have to. You, yeah. There are a lot of customers, not just you. But at home, you can take your time. You can boil the water. You can, you know, wait until, uh, you know, the tea has really uh, infused very well with the water and the milk. Mm. Uh, and the spices wow. and so you know it's always attending to tea or cooking with care and love and give it your attention and focus the outcome is usually better than <laughs> anything if you do it very quickly just enjoying the moment in making tea yes exactly the process and all and this actually reminded me mm. when I was doing my umrah in Medina so uh, they, drink, they like to drink uh, milk tea a lot there as well but then there was one time I was walking past by a, a, a shop then I saw this uh, uncle, eh? uh, Amula, uh, they, they call it there. There is, uh, uh, he was drinking tea, but the tea looked different. The milk tea looked very different. And it something similar to the ones uh, some, uh, that we sell, sometimes see in Sarbat tea, you know. I, I like to drink mm. in Sarbat mm -hmm. tea. So I was, uh, you know, I was, uh, it's been a long time since I last drink that tea. So I asked him, where can I find this tea? What, what's it called? Then he told, me, he, he told me that you this tea, you won't find this anywhere near here. This tea is called Shai Adni. Ah, ah yes, 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 yes. So Shai is in Chai, lah, right? Yeah. yeah. You've heard of Shai Adni before? Yeah, I've, I've uh, drank Shai Adni twice. One in uh, one in Jordan, in mm. Amman, uh, and the other in Malaysia, actually. There is a Yemeni restaurant in um, Damansara, if I'm not mistaken. Wow, okay. Uh, I think it's called Hadramo, the ah. restaurant. Uh, and they had Shai Adni. So I, I had it on my Facebook a long time ago because <laughs> I had pictures of both Shai uh -huh. Adni and I said, you know, I, which one do you think is, is better? Just from the look of it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit, uh, the colour is a bit uh, orange. unique. Yeah, yes. orange in colour. That's color. right. I think, you know, that has to do with the amount of milk, the type of milk, but also more importantly, the type of tea leaves. 
Ah, yeah, okay. so in the so such a big range of tea leaves and where they come from, right? You know that there are tea growing nations like uh, I think the the very popular ones are uh, Sri Lanka uh, associated with Assam tea, uh, Ceylon tea, uh, also China, and also the Himalayas. You know, so these are tree growing regions, uh, tea growing regions, and also uh, Tebo, I think, right? Cameron Highlands, Cameron Highlands, Malaysia. They have their own set of tea yes, leaves. they have their tea leaves. Yes, oh, okay. it's also quite nice. Uh, so the Sarbat ones, I, I I don't particularly know, but Sarbat tea, it's not uh, loose leaves. They have they actually blend everything. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you have different <laughs> types, and they do give different colors. Ah. I think there's some kind of treatment as well. So in the treatment of the tea leaves, once they've dried it, um, they might put certain things, and that gives uh, the herbs and. Uh, yeah, I, I hope it's natural. Uh, yeah, not not chemicals or whatever, yeah. but it does give off a certain uh, uh, color, certain taste to it. You know, the the punginess, the bitterness, and so on. So there's a lot to learn. Just tea, you know, it's a simple thing. Everything, you know, we think that you know, just order tea. It's a simple thing, but it can be very complex. Yeah. As complex as you want it to be. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So about that, uh, Mufti. I think you mentioned in episode zero. Uh, some of the tea significance of or, or, or why we drink tea which is uh, as how you mentioned being uh, first having a sense of uh, uh, simplicity and tranquility and lastly it's about hospitality so I mean uh, of course one of the joys of uh, drinking tea is when we drink with, uh, with uh, our family members our friends especially you know sometimes in uh, tea shops so about um, hospitality and with tea um, why is it uh, that we have jo- uh, we have a sense of joy every time we uh, converse with our friends, we, we, we have a conversation with our friends? So is it important for us to have conversations? Um, yeah, before I, if, if I may, before I uh, address this uh, or discuss about conversation, I think um, tea for me is important because it symbolizes a few things you mentioned, uh, one of which is hospitality. Um, you know, we drink tea on our own or alone, um, but we also often, as you said earlier, we drink tea with guests. Mm. Um, and therefore, it symbolizes a hospitality, which I think is a very, very powerful um, value and culture, mm. um, not just uh, within Islam, but also in our community. The culture of hospitality, of accepting and welcoming guest, mm. um, and I think uh, that metaphor of uh, hospitality in terms of welcoming uh, guests to your own home or to your place, right? Uh, it could yeah. be your, it could be your, um, you know, your office or anywhere else, but someone uh, visiting you. I think that metaphor is very uh, pertinent as we think of uh, conversations, as we think of. Uh, engaging other people um, and particularly other people who are different. Um, so in this regard, I just wanted to um, also talk about two things. One is, uh, you know, the story of uh, the guests of uh, Nabi Ibrahim, alayhi salam, alayhi yeah. salam, right? Uh, Prophet Ibrahim, or Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, is known as the, the paragon of hospitality because of a particular story. Yeah. I think you know about this story. Uh, in the Quran, uh, it's mentioned a few times. Uh, one of which is in Surah Al Zariyat, Hal uh, Ataka Hadithu Daifi Ibrahim Al Mukramin. So, um, the story of uh, the honored guest of Abraham who came. Um, but there is something very, uh, you know, interesting and unique about this story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is because uh, these were guests that uh, Nabi Ibrahim uh, did not know. Uh, a, he, he don't know them, mm-hmm. and B, he wasn't expecting them. He wasn't expecting anyone to come. Uh, so, if dakhalu alayhi faqalu salama, right? So, they came to him, to his house, and, and, and went in and said, uh, salam. Uh, now, you know this, um, uh, when we think of uh, this story and think of the significance of it, you look at the, how the sequence of events so he wasn't expecting anyone. He didn't know them, uh, but he just heard a salam at the door. Yeah. Faqalu salama. Then the Quran says the first thing he 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 
said, Nabi Ibrahim said in response was, Kala salam. MashaAllah. He responded with yes. peace as well. Yeah. Uh, he did not actually, you know, like like sometimes we do, we, we try to pick out who, yeah. who's at the door. <laughs> you know, are these strangers? And are they are they like, you know, are they a threat uh-huh. or bringing harm or something? Yeah. So the first thing is salam. And, and he also said, Kala salamun qawmu munkarun. So, this group of people who came, the, the guests, Munkarun, they are, um, some say it's uh, unknown, mm-hmm. unknown to him, unknown to everybody around him, uh, and some say unusual, so they look a bit different. Mm. But the first response is salam, right? Peace, because they they offered peace and he immediately offered peace, regardless of who they were. Mm. Regardless of who they were. Um, and that that is a first um, uh, virtue of hospitality that shines through very powerfully. Um, so hospitality is like, you know, even to offer tea, you don't actually say whether you know this person or not. The yeah. person sat next to you, you just offer the person tea. Can be a friend, can be a stranger. But hospitality is not to make those kind of, uh, you know, distinctions. So today, you know, the, of course, we know about the hospitality industry. People talk about, you know, the hotel industry and so on. Um, I think uh, in, in some ways, hospitality is used in a very uh, liberal way, in a very broad way, but it's nothing near to the hospitality that we actually talk about in terms of a spiritual value because uh, you go to hotels, you have to pay, right? Yeah. And, and, and the more the, the, the more service you expect, the, the more you have to pay. Yeah. So nothing is free. They won't offer you tea unless you, know, you have paid for the... So strangers come, they actually don't offer you drinks, right? But unless you are a booked um, customer or client of the hotel, yeah. then of course you get the treatment. Uh, and and then he, the second thing he did was فَرَغَ ila ahlihi, And... He didn't ask them. So according to the story of Quran, and, and there's uh, little evidence to show in the in the text itself that uh, they didn't ask him, or he didn't ask them whether uh, are they hungry, do you need food. They, he offered immediately. Faragha ila ahli. So he went to his family uh, in in a haste, like you know, quickly he went. So shows that it's a it's an automatic sort of default uh, um, uh, behavior and culture hmm. uh, that Nabi Ibrahim showed, which he went to his family. And then Fajr Abi Ajlin Samin, and he came out with a fat roasted cow, <laughs> and it's Samin. So it's not like it's so it, it means it's the best food. Yeah. So you have a group of people who came over. You don't know them. You didn't invite them. You were not expecting them. Came over to your place, then said salam. Then said salam. Replied with salam and come in. And then he said, um, and he prepared food for them and the best food. Abi Ajlin Samin, a fat roasted cow. Uh, and then he presented you know the food to them mm-hmm. uh, uh, do you not eat so no, but they were hesitant because they were angels yeah right in in the, in the shape of human beings so yeah. obviously they don't eat uh, and he so he said you know do you not want do you not eat ala ta'kulun? and then when they you know they the way they reacted Nabi Ibrahim felt uh, something is not right here. So, yeah. just I mean, khifa. So he started to to have a bit of fear, like you know, are these people all right? A bit suspicious. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are they? You know, who are they? Why don't they eat? Yeah. This is like a fat roasted calf. I brought it up for you. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, and they said, Kalu la takhaf. <laughs> right? They said to him, don't don't be afraid because we come here to bring you the good news. Kalu la takhaf wa basharuhu bi ghulamin alim. So the, you know. Uh, Gave him the glad tiding of a child mm. uh, that is uh, knowledgeable. Um, so the story then goes on uh, to other things, but I think the in terms of hospitality, the story of Nabi Ibrahim Salam was first. You know, you he um, regardless of who they were. Yeah, despite um, being uh, someone who is we are someone we are unfamiliar with, and then the circumstances being that we are not un- we are unaware of their coming. Yes, and also the whether you need food or not but brought it out first. And the best kind of food. And yes, the best thing that, that sure. is in his kitchen probably. Yeah. Um, although they didn't eat it because they, they're not, they don't eat mm. uh, our food. So that is a very powerful story. And I, I also reminded the, um, you know, the in, in terms of greetings and um, salam in that particular uh, story, you also, we also know that Quran talks about um, a general sort of teaching, وَإِذَا حُيِّيْتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ Right. Uh, when you are greeted 
with a greeting and, and it doesn't say what kind of greeting it doesn't say assalamu alaikum tahiya mm. just a greeting which means that when people show respect to us fahayyu bi ahsana minha so respond and greet the other person who has greeted you bi ahsana minha with a greeting that is better than what they have offered you a dua that's better aw ruduha at the very least respond equally mm. Again, you know, um, uh, and I wanted to use this this metaphor to conversations and um, uh, hospitality because I think um, conversations are very important because uh, you know we we learn about other people, mm-hmm. uh, we learn about their perspectives, and that of course helps us to understand not just other people but understand the world better, which is a very complex world. Yeah, um, but. There is an art to a conversation, especially ah. yes, when you when you when you um, you know when you uh, want to learn about others and so on. And I think it's a very very difficult. Uh, it's easy easy. Uh, it's an easy sort of uh, principle, but it's a very difficult thing to practice. You you need to practice it, uh, which is um, to um, begin with detaching ourselves. From whatever the other person is saying, in terms of trying to interpret it through our lens. Oh, okay. And that is about listening very carefully, and empathizing with the other person. So, um, you know, the uh, 10th century uh, mystic, uh, Muslim mystic uh, in in Baghdad, he said about this problem of uh, we human beings like to put ourselves at the center. <laughs> so everybody else. Right, it's always at Revolves the periphery. Around, yeah. yeah, you are always at the center, um, and because of that, you like to annex people. <laughs> what that means is, whatever people say is always an annex. Mm. Uh, you know, annexes, right? We, we some most people don't actually read annexes unless yeah, okay. absolutely <laughs> necessary. <laughs> um, we don't. So, what it means is usually we don't listen carefully to people, and we don't seek to understand them. Yeah. Um, and we quickly judge. So this problem of even the story of Nabi Ibrahim, I think a very important lesson is also prejudging. Yeah. If he had prejudged them, presumptions and all. Presum. Yes. The, he presumed that they were a threat. Yeah. He presumed that they they were something else. He would not have responded salam. He would not have prepared that wonderful food uh, for his guest. So when when we look at people who are different as our guests, uh, that. Requires an openness to you know just to listen um, and, and to you know to learn from other people, and I think it's very important today because uh, we all know this. We have been saying this for a long time. You know, uh, our society is very diverse. Community is very diverse. Um, not everyone is like us. In fact, yeah. they can be very different. They have different experiences. You know, different learning pathways, different family context, social context. Um, how do we find something? Uh, common that allows us to to live together amidst this diversity. Um, you know, uh, for example, lifestyles. You know, we uh, we have very clear teachings in Islam about um, you know as Muslims how we lead our lives. Um, but there are people who struggle, and I'm, here I'm referring to Muslims, for example, struggle because they have, for whatever reasons and um, experiences that they have, and uh, you know sometimes it's childhood, sometimes it's um, a certain certain uh, you know social experience and context and challenges um, you know they are what they are and but they are different from us mm-hmm. um, give a, a clear example like you know someone who is from the LGBT community um, so the question is if you talk about hospitality you talk about uh, conversations how yeah. do you how do you start off with the... yeah I mean how do you discuss these issues mm-hmm. right um, I think, uh, and in fact, in the past, I've been also asked the question of, you know, there are atheists, uh, either the atheists who are very anti-Islam and attack Islam, or there are Muslims who are influenced by atheism. So we should, you know, we should just come out and 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 attack atheism and you know Draw reject the line. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, we need to think through very carefully how we approach this kind of differences yeah. in general. Yeah. And I think the the first right step is to not assume that we understand mm. everything fully. Yeah. So for whether it's atheism, whether it's LGBT, I think we need to listen to people at yeah. least to understand. 
Because that is an, a very, very important part of understanding a particular issue. And therefore, you, you, you think about what is the best response. There are many cases where uh, we prejudge, we presume, and therefore we, 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 we say that you know, the response is such and such, and it doesn't work. Because no one listens to you. Yeah. Uh, no one thinks it's effective. And all you do is you keep ostracizing or you keep you know, excluding people from your own <laughs> community. Yeah, which creates more problems. And eventually, there won't be any, more, any form of uh, understanding between, between two parties or more. Exactly. And um, you know, um, even as uh, in, in our position, sometimes we, we are forced to, or you know, people expect us to take a certain position mm. and state what that position is. Um, and I think um, in some cases that is necessary, but in many other cases, I think that is not the first right thing to do, is to really show empathy by listening, mm. having a conversation with yeah. people. Um, having conversation, by the way, doesn't mean you agree. Yeah. It doesn't mean you are the same. It doesn't, uh, just because I sit with you and I listen to you, doesn't mean I become like you. Uh, we had the same problem with interfaith in the very early days. Mm. If you recall, when you know we have an interfaith conversation, uh, people think that just when you sit with a non-Muslim and your faith is under threat uh. and you might become like them, well, they might also worry that of, of the same thing, right? So yeah. I think there are parameters, and I think um, that fear never materialized because that was never the objective. The objective was just to to. Uh, learn from each other. So you mentioned about uh, listening to the other. Sometimes, you know, uh, especially about regarding when we when we want to listen to the other, whether we disagree or uh, we, we, whether we agree or disagree, how can we actually um, learn uh, to to listen to the other better? Yeah, uh, you know, listening uh, is is amazing. You know, it's uh, it's it's such a powerful powerful tool to empower us. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make us better, but and I think that's probably why it's so difficult, right? Um, and one of the reasons probably we don't listen is because uh, it starts with um, our mentality as to where we place ourselves. Yeah. So when we put ourselves again, I go back to that uh, saying of the mystic: when you put yourself at the center, right at the center, and you assume that position where you know everything, <laughs> right? Um, I don't think you will listen. Yeah. So the same thing in our families, with our spouse, with our children, especially your children. If you start saying that, you know, my children knows nothing. I mean, they're just kids. I know better that kind of attitude. You won't listen to them. And, and we all know what happens when you don't listen. Communication can, can really break down. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so one of the prerequisites, I think, which can help us listen better, um, even in our conversations with friends, with stakeholders, with different members of our society and community is that element of trust mm. that people can offer something new, people can offer a perspective that you may not necessarily have mm. yeah. and, and a blind spot. So you need to recognize that for yourself. It's very important to have that. And always believe that, well, someone says something, maybe 90% you already know or you, you, um, you uh, may not agree with, but if you look out for something positive, you will find, even if it's 10%. Mm. And you realize, wow, I learned something new now. There's always that small bit for us to learn. Exactly. And mm. it starts with your niyat. So niyat is very important, intention, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and niyat is so important in Islam. And I always say this, if you set out to look for something good in someone or in anything, you will find it, mm. however hidden that thing may be. But if you set out to look for something wrong that someone does, even if even to if if you look someone else looks at that person and say, well, oh, I, I didn't see anything wrong, but you spotted the mistake because you were out to spot the mistake. <laughs> so niyat is important. So I was uh, this morning I was uh, looking at some YouTube videos and I uh, found this uh, YouTube uh, video on the discussion between. Uh, the coaching staff of Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> yeah, so Jurgen Klopp, uh, you know, uh, I mean, our listeners may, may or may not know this, but I'm a big Liverpool, Liverpool fan, so I'm sorry <laughs> if this upsets non-Liverpool fans. But I like uh, the current Liverpool team in particular, not only because of the football on the field, but I, I there are a lot of lessons that you can also learn. I mean, as much as you can also learn from other man top managers and clubs. 
Um, I watched this interview between uh, discussion between the coaching staff, um, Jürgen Klopp, uh, Peter Krawitz, and Pepin Linders. So the three, and these were questions on management. Mm. Um, and you know what uh, Jürgen Klopp said at the end? He said, after answering all the questions, he yeah. said, "Listen and learn." Wow. That was his 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 you know uh, ending. He said, "Listen and learn," and he says, "Listen and learn to these people." His so he actually listens and he learns from his both his coaching uh, staff, um, and he has said this many times that um, you know he can do his job very well because he listens to the right people, but he also listens a lot, even to his uh, listen from his players, um, and he says. You know, I do this every day. That's my job. Wow! Listen and learn. Listen and learn, and I, it, it proves itself, right? In yeah. terms of how how the the outcomes that we want. Um, so I think the same thing for us. Um, if we learn to listen more, and we want to learn from what we listen, I think we will uh, be able to improve. It's very tough, even for me. I think it's something I really hope to to uh, improve on. Uh, but I'm certain that um, you will never. Lose out by listening and saying less, um, because um, I think you know God puts wisdom in so many uh, yeah. different hearts and minds. And if you look for that wisdom, you know al hikmah dalatul mu'min. If you can find it, if you look for it, right? They're just people who look for uh, you know uh, dig uh, for gold and you know minerals and mine for diamonds and so on. Uh, if they do that every day, at one day they will. <laughs> They will Eventually, most likely yeah, discover it. So I think that should be our intention. Every day we wake up in the morning, um, we want to learn something new, um, and the way to learn is to listen, right? And in conversations, I think you know different people, different groups, different lifestyles, learn about them, and and then you can think about what what will be the response because your response can hurt people, yeah, terribly. Uh, your words can really hurt people terribly. And I don't think that is something we, we want, Muslims yeah. especially want to do. So, um, listening, uh, and that is part of um, conversations, and listening in a hospitable way, um, that the person who's talking is your guest, uh, and like you want the best for your guests, give them the best food, make the best tea, present the best food. Um, same thing, let them speak, put them at the center. And then you understand them better, and then you can have a very fruitful relationship. Mashallah. That actually uh, summarizes up all the uh, points that we were discussing throughout this uh, this whole episode. So, from enjoying hospitality, as part of, uh, which is part of uh, a virtue in, in in our Islamic tradition, and also to um, create conversations and to communicate with one another, and which it, which all of that begins with listening. Uh, you you share with us the the importance of of listening and how we can listen by not putting ourselves in the center, but putting the other in the center. Thank you so much, Mufti. That uh, actually uh, I'm really enlightened by by the whole discussion. I learned a lot for in this episode, and I hope the listeners have uh, enjoyed this episode as well. So look out for more episodes uh, in uh, Tea with Mufti. And with that, we we'll see each other each other in the next episode. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.